Math integration part three. So last week, we defined two things. We defined the time ordering operator and the functional derivative. And uh, after defining these, we moved into a place, a magical place, a fun place called Fox Base. Where I would say if you enjoy the name Bone Daddy, become a grad student. <laughs> Thank you, Tyrion. Thank you so much for that. And the YouTube is ruined. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, if anybody is, does watch this on YouTube, you're just, you gotta deal with this. Um, so then Foxbase was a nice place where you can go and uh, talk about things as creation and annihilation operators, which made things a lot easier. And then um, we asked about finding or integrating over all paths from the ground state to the ground state, a place with zero particles to a place with zero particles and all that stuff in between, we can count it, right? Now, today we're going to figure out how to count it, but yesterday we were, or not yesterday, last week we just sort of set it up. We introduced the I epsilon, which is the small infinitesimal that we use to get rid of higher order terms that we don't want, that don't mean anything to us, so that we can actually talk about the ground state going to the ground state as a thing, and we don't have to worry about, we don't have to include everything if we uh, find that it's not going to be beneficial to us. So, uh, and we'll see that as well. Um, so this left us with our last expression. So let's see here, a path integration part three and if you've been here for the first two parts thank you for sticking around let's start part three this left us with this last equation where we had uh going from one ground state to the other ground state and considering all the paths in between left us with um this integral over all paths times the exponential times i uh, of the integral of what seemingly was the action, but we're gonna write it all out. dt p q dot uh, minus, let's get that minus in there somewhere. Can't use that one, gotta use this one. Minus this one minus i epsilon infinitesimal times the Hamiltonian, which is gonna do something I think the I infinitesimal is going to be like super cool for today uh, because it's one of those things where we add it so ad hocly to like get the things we want and to get rid of the things we don't want. But yeah, it does. It plays such a cool role uh, in this stuff. <clears throat> What's next? So now we are going to use perturbation theory. And this is where I stopped last time. I wanted to make sure I was able to speak a moment on perturbation. You don't need the minus in natural units. <laughs> Oh no, uh, I understood that reference. I don't understand much. Um, so what is perturbation theory? Well, you can take some Hamiltonian and you get this nice, uh, and we know that like when we apply it to certain uh, states, we get a nice looking eigenfunction. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and when we apply it to some state, we get a nice eigenvalue times the state, you know, the eigenstate again, blah, blah, blah. But we know that reality does not act like that, right? And what we, what we could do is say like, uh, what if we want to be a little bit more specific to, a, to an object, right? So say we have, uh, so let's define a new Hamiltonian, right? Where we have this nice original Hamiltonian that tells that we can act on an eigenstate and get a nice eigen, looking eigenvalue with the eigenstate attached to it. But we also have this term right here, which is a Hamiltonian term, right? It's still a Hamiltonian term, but it can include other factors. Like say you want to flip on a magnetic field and watch what happens to the electron. Right, then that's going to look different than if you just have those nice eigenvalues working on a free moving electron and a free field and blah, 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 whatever, we don't care. But an, you turn on the magnetic field and you'll get some contribution. And this is what we would like to see realistically in uh, you know, real life. We can, we can actually think about stuff that, that acts like this. Um, and then we'll have to deal with it though, right? Because we're not just going to get nice eigenvalues of eigenstates. We're going to get some sloppy stuff. But let's deal with it in a minute here. Um, all right. So let's not, let's just suppress. So we're going to, for a, a few minutes, we're going to suppress the uh, the one, or the, yeah, the uh, I epsilon for now. Uh, and then we'll bring it back. So suppress this for now. 
So I'm not gonna be writing all the terms with I epsilon. It's there, we'll bring it back when we need it. But for now, let's just talk about what it looks like if we have this, uh, this full Hamiltonian in our path integral. So we'll have the integral over all paths uh, times the exponent of I times the integral of negative infinity to positive infinity <clears throat> of dt. And then this is gonna be the, uh, the Hamiltonian. It's basically the same thing, except now we just have to worry about this uh, original Hamiltonian. Oh wait, I added too many. Too many parentheses. This uh, nice solvable Hamiltonian uh, with eigenvalues and eigenstates that look nice and then this um, somewhat of an abomination thing that we're going to attach to it that gives us more realistic things. Uh, parentheses and square and we're good. Okay. <clears throat> now. Uh, so what can we do with this? Well, here's, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna be a little bit sneaky in our ways, okay? Uh, and this is where you get to see the first thing that we talked about last week, one of those tools I taught you that I was like, I know this seems arbitrary, but we're gonna call upon it later. We're calling on one now, and it's the functional derivative. We can actually do something really nice with the functional derivative. We're gonna suppose that H1 is made up of some P's and Q's. Why do we suppose that? Because it says P's and Q's right there. And then we're gonna suppose that because we have these interaction terms that are happening on it, or the forces, these external forces, F and H, that are going to happen on our system, then we can take the use of our functional derivative, which is going to be like, you know, bringing down these P's and Q's. Uh, we can actually use that to construct whatever this perturbation is. So we're gonna say this is gonna be equal to EXP. Uh, Oh, okay, good, 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 good. I times the integral of minus infinity plus infinity uh, dt of h1 time uh, of, and then now the, now the exponents are gonna be replaced, or the, I'm sorry, not the exponents, the uh, innards, the variables, one might call them, are gonna be replaced by one over i uh, and then these functionals of one of F and one of H. Now the role of these functionals again is every time that we apply one of these functionals to this, we're gonna end up, all this is gonna go away and we're just gonna get random P's and Q's, or not random, but very specific P's and Q's based on what we need. So say that the, you know, say the Hamiltonian, say the perturbation is just some, you know, some factor on P. Well that means all we have to do is take one integral of here, we'll get the P down, and then we have our perturbation. And then the constants can be taken care of uh, the way that we take care of constants always. Uh, by just, I mean, they're inside the Hamiltonian, so they don't go anywhere. But it is just a switch of the variables. So then we'll get the integral again, uh, sum over, or integral over all pass of P of Q, the X P I, then the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity, ooh positive infinity of dt, and then p q dot minus the original nice looking Hamiltonian uh, plus all the other stuff that we need, like our fq plus, uh, what do we have, hp, parentheses, square bracket. Okay, and we're good. So now, assuming, and we could just say this again, let me just kind of reiterate what this is. So now we have the exponential of our Hamiltonian inside the action, and what we can do is just take it out front, right? Because it's just gonna be the exponential. Any additions in the exponent, uh, we can rewrite that as an explanation of E, you know, or E times E with, you know, this, and then the other one as well. And then, so we can pull all that out in front. We can now change our variables to, instead of having P and Q as a variable, we can have our functional derivative of H and our functional derivative of F. Uh, simply because we know that we can form everything. Using this, we can get whatever perturbation we need for P and Q. <clears throat> but this is nice, because now we can sort of see that we have two separate things, right? We have this exponent of the perturbation, and then we're right back to the same original one that we have up here, 
where we have our Hamiltonian is now just the solvable Hamiltonian with eigenvalues and things like that. And that will still, that won't go away. We're still going to have to deal with that, but it actually works out very nicely. Okay. Now, this works well. Uh, hold on, wait a second. Oh, okay, so this works well because, like I said, h, uh, h sub 0 is a solvable Hamiltonian. Okay, so that means that we have the following. We want to get to Lagrangian mechanics just because, like, uh, Lagrangian stuff is nice. So when you're ready for classical mechanics in your career, you'll see classical mechanics, and you'll do this whole transformation from Hamiltonians to Lagrangians. Uh, and the action looks really nice in a Lagrangian. So we want to get back to that Lagrangian formalism. So we have four conditions. Now, again, if you have the notes from the Discord then you can just look at the notes and read them off with me. If not, then just you can listen and I'll explain what they are. The four conditions that we need to get to Lagrangian formalism are, we need H1, the Hamiltonian, or the perturbation of the Hamiltonian, to be dependent only on Q, which is not that bad. In fact, a lot of things you see in quantum mechanics, a lot of the ham uh, perturbations you see are only going to be dependent on the position and not the actual momentum. Um, second line, if we want to be interested in the time ordering, uh, oh, and, okay, excuse me, if we are only interested in the time ordering of Q's, and again, not P's, because if you remember, the idea was to get out of P. So what we did was, um, the first, first path integration part, we figured out how to do the Lagrangian, or the Hamiltonian to Lagrangian, and that was to use the Hamiltonian, or the Lagrangian equation of motions, solve for P, and then substitute p back into the original Hamil or the original action, and that got rid of the p's, and we could end up going to Lagrangian formalism. Uh, so if we're only interested in the time ordering of q's, then p's won't be relevant. If h is no more quadratic in p, why? Because remember, in order to get out of that, in order to get the integral to go away, we needed to have p be a, a Gaussian, the integral of the exponent to a p squared. That was Gaussian, and then we could take that constant from the Gaussian integral and absorb it into these guys. Okay? And then lastly, if that quadratic p does not rely on q, because again, <laughs> like, we want it to be constant. We want it to go away. Okay? So those are the four conditions. And if we do all that, then we can go into our Lagrangian formalism. So I'm going to write that down at the bottom. And then uh, where's chat? Chat is literally right below this thing, starting here. So I can't cross that threshold. Okay. And then I'm going to write the Lagrangian formalism for this, assuming all of those four conditions are met, which, like I said, in a lot of quantum mechanics classes, they are. Don't worry about it. Um, am I above the camera, though? Man, this is going to be a tight squeeze. That is also what they called me in high school. Okay. And it is uh, zero on zero. And it's going to be, uh, and then of course f and h, the exponent of i integral of negative infinity to positive infinity of dt times the Lagrangian 1, which is again the Lagrangian from the perturbation. Uh, and now there's no more h functional because uh, it doesn't rely on P anymore. I'm not gonna make it. So I could probably just do times. Can you guys read that? Uh, the integral of negative infinity to positive infinity of dt times the Lagrangian, and now this is the original Lagrangian. <clears throat> well, let me say it again real quick, because I don't know if you guys saw it or not. And then, okay, you did see it. How can we know what we did? <laughs> How can we know what we didn't see? Clever. Um, no, this, if you saw this equation, this is the path integral from zero, from ground state to ground state, that amplitude, all writ cast in a, in a Lagrangian, in a Lagrangian formalism is what we did. Did you see all that? Um, and that was it. I didn't really say anything else. I just, that's where I left off. <laughs> I 
Anyways, I'm gonna assume you guys saw this, uh, but if you did, well, maybe I shouldn't assume that. Anyways, the point, the only thing I did say was, uh, the four conditions which you can find in the notes on Discord, uh, are what we are necessary to get it so it's not acting on, so there's no P involved and we can write it as just a function of Q. As a Lagrangian, okay? Now, here's the good news. After this, we're done with chapter six. Hooray! Yay! Yeah, you did it all! Yay! We made it through the chapter together. And now it's on to chapter 7. So I have no idea how this YouTube video is going to come out now. <laughs> oh no. <clears throat> and we're going to do all of chapter 7 today because I don't know if you guys actually like looked at Shred Nikki, but it's two pages. Or maybe three pages. It's like two and a half. It's very short. But it is... Your friend and mine, is NC still here? It's the Harmonic Oscillator. Um, he is, hi NC. Um, we need color chalk for, divide, divide. I don't know what that is. I might just not be very bright, I think. Okay. Um, I don't know what happened with OBS. I really hope it doesn't happen again though. Because that's not nice. OBS is not treating me very nice. Uh, okay. Let's keep going. The uh, chapter 7. Chapter 7 is the path integration for your friend and mine, harmonic oscillator. Everybody loves the harmonic oscillator. You do physics, you do the harmonic oscillator. Uh, and we know the Hamiltonian, right? It's one Hamiltonian that we've seen a million times. Look at Justin. It's quantum. Max cheered 500 bits. Thank you so much. Thank you, Max. I appreciate that. It's harmonic oscillators all the way down. <laughs> it's harmonic oscillators all the way down. It really is. Thank you so much, Max. Back to work for NC. <laughs> Go back to work. No longer be here. <laughs> <laughs> Just responding to incentives out of my hands. Nice. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So, yes. Look at Justin. It's quantum. Uh, okay. So, now we know what the harmonic oscillator is, right? P squared, 1 over 2m times P squared. I'm not really going to be writing hats on everything. Uh, <clears throat> we can just imagine that we'll switch to quantum, or we'll switch from quantum to classical when we do the path integration part. Uh, <clears throat> plus 1 half m omega squared q squared so now we have two uh terms in our in our uh our, our whew, hamiltonian we have one over two m times p squared plus one half m omega squared q squared now let's actually do some path integration so we want to find out what it means to go from the ground state to the ground state uh with some external force f of q so let's find so let's see find find uh with uh f oh sorry with an external force f of q or f times q uh in the harmonic oscillator so this is the goal and remember we had a goal for chapter six too and now we have a goal for chapter seven find Zero to zero with an external force, with an external, wow, how did I screw that up so much? External force FQ in the harmonic oscillator. Okay. Uh, so what's it look like first? Well, let's write it down, okay? And this is what it looks like. We have our sum over all, or integral over all pass for P, integral over all pass for Q, times the exponent of I, times the integral of the action. Lights, camera, and now I've written the action. I'm like a Twitch physics streamer. And this is just the same thing that we've been working with this whole time. The integral of the action is P Q dot minus one minus I epsilon times the Hamiltonian plus FQ. So that I epsilon's made its way back and it's going to be very necessarily, necessary for us. 
So I'm going to do a big step and I'm not going to do all of the math, but you can go ahead back to the first video on this part one and you can uh, do the math if you'd like. And uh, I would love to see it if anybody wants to do it. Maybe I'll do it this weekend or something. I don't know, but probably not. Uh, and if you do end up doing it, please post it on Discord. I'd be interested to see it. But if you've been following along, then you might be able to piece it together uh, like I did kind of like in your brain and realize that this is, has to be true. Um, but basically what we're going to be doing is we're going to carry out this multiplication right here. And so when we start multiplying this together, we can see some things are happening, right? So we'll have this times m, we'll have this times m omega squared, and uh, both of them will have a one half in there that I, I forgot. Um, but yeah, so we can do all that, and then we can try to rearrange it by moving the i, the one minus i epsilon around. And then we're also going to do the same thing that we just talked about, where we want to go from Hamiltonian uh, action to the Lagrangian action. And that means that we're going to end up having to do the Lagrangian equation of motion, solve for p, substitute p back in for here, and then we'll be in our Lagrangian formalism. But I'm going to just show all of that, show the final product. And again, in my notes, I literally have write, written, you carry out this multiplication, uh, and then you go to Lagrangian formalism. So that's what you have to do. You have to do exactly that stuff. Solve for the Lagrangian equation of motion, solve for p, plug it into here, and then you're into the Lagrangian step. And what do you get when you do that? Well, you get the integral of overall q's. Uh, this is actually relying on the force f. Um, <clears throat> times the exponent, exponential of i times the integral of negative infinity to positive infinity of dt times everything in square brackets, which is one half. We're actually now writing out the Hamiltonian uh, with this one minus or one plus. Like you can do either or depending on how you do it. <clears throat> and all of that is stuff you'll have to play with as well. And plus, since it's infinitesimal, you can also just be like, it doesn't matter that much. Uh, when in reality, it matters kind of a little bit. 1 minus i epsilon times m omega squared q squared plus fq. Now, pretty much what I would say is just take it for granted. That's what I did, or that's what I'm doing right now. I mean, like, you can kind of see how it would make sense if you could multiply this by 1 minus i epsilon. You can also multiply it. By 1 over 1 plus i epsilon or something like along those lines. You can manipulate it around. And uh, what does that mean? Well, that means that you can just, again, do the Lagrangian formalism to get down there. And now we don't have any more momentums in there. <clears throat> so here we are. Uh, we did our big step. And just do what I do and take this for granted. But if you want some time, if you want some practice with solving things, then you can get from this step to this step by the way that I described. Now, uh, Let's do a Fourier transform. So I'm going to write, I'm going to erase this. That way I can write down what the Fourier transform is going to be at the top. And that when, when we do it, it will make more sense. I kind of want this though. Eh, you guys will just have to bring it back. Bring it back now, y'all. Now, if you're, again, if you're following the notes from Discord, then it doesn't really matter much because it's still here. Ahem. <clears throat> <laughs> just calculated a Fourier transform. I know, it is you. Look at that timing. Did you know that I was going to call upon you to help us transform? Okay. Uh, so what is that transform? Well, we want to get out of time and we want to get into energy. Don't worry. We will go back to time. It's inevitable to go back to time. Actually, I don't think in quantum field theory a lot of times you go back to time. But in this one we will. So the Fourier transform is going to go as follows. This uh, position with as dependent on energy is going to be given by um, the following integral i with e as an eigenvalue of qt. And then here's qt, which is going to be given as an integral of minus infinity to positive infinity of dE over 2 pi. And as you know, we do a lot of things with energy and time. Uh, they're very relatable on a lot of levels. And that's okay. And here's Q as a function of E. <laughs> Lauren, Lauren, hey, thank you for the subscription. Two months with us. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the support. 
Thank you, thank you. Lots of support today, thank you guys. Okay, and onward to the next step, which is to take just the thing in the square brackets, basically, that is the action stuff. Um, action, uh, action, Sam, for action. Uh, and we're going to do this. We're going to set that equal to the following. Now we just really had the action had like, you know, all of those one plus I epsilon M blah, blah, blah. Oh, by the way, if I haven't said it yet, which I absolutely am gonna do, uh, for simplicity, you know what we're gonna do, right? We're gonna set mass is equal to one because it's mass, who cares, right? All mass is relative. I'm getting distracted. Oh yes, that's right. We are doing, we're in the middle of a Fourier transform. Um, as our good friend Fourier has arrived. And uh, so now we had that thing in the action with all the one minus i's and then the m's, which I'm setting all the masses equal to, for, to one. So let's finish this uh, Fourier transform. Uh, when you do a Fourier transform, you only want to Fourier transform one variable at a time. So the terms that are quadratic will have to have two separate uh, values for, so we'll call them e and e prime. Don't worry, something beautiful happens with that. And you'll see why when we actually solve this, you'll see what happens uh, and why it's necessary to evaluate with separate variables. Uh, but this is the term of the, of the old action. It's gonna get a little bit messy here. Negative one plus I epsilon times E, E prime. Wait, what? Oh, okay. Minus one minus I epsilon omega squared times Q squiggly, Q squiggly prime and F, oh wait, plus F squiggly E, Q squiggly E prime plus F squiggly E prime, Q squiggly E, and then all the necessary parentheses. <laughs> so you're saying to yourself, Eric, we had a nice little action here. What have you done? Why did you screw this all up? Can you briefly explain what the Fourier transform does in this case? Absolutely. So this, in, uh, this Fourier transform, I will actually explain that in just a second, Lauren. Uh, so the Fourier transform, we are going from time, which was in our last step, into energy. And when you do that, something really beautiful happens, but you gotta give me a step to show it. Um, something very beautiful and something very soon will happen. Uh, it seems very uh, irrelevant, but uh, it will play a big role. Okay, cool. Uh, so now, we went from something very small and something relatively looked like kind of manageable to something kind of hairy. Uh, but it's all very necessary. So, the only T that we get exists here, okay? That's true, right? There's no more T in the action, except right here. So, uh, what do we do with this? Well, we can integrate it to get a prefactor. And that prefactor is what? Well, that prefactor is going to be the Dirac delta. So two pi times the delta function of E, E prime. Remember, this is, in fact, the definition of the Dirac delta function, right? We can always write that as a, an integral. And what does that mean? Well, then that means that we can take this integral and do it and integrate over d e prime. And if we integrate over a Dirac delta, that means we're going to take the, the variable, which is e prime, and we're going to, oh, this is plus, I'm sorry, this is plus. My bad, my bad, my bad. Um, and we're gonna take this inter, this uh, vin, er, inter Integration variable, and we're going to then plug in, you know, the other term into the function. So everywhere there is an e prime, we will replace it with an e, and that is how you integrate over the Dirac delta. What does that mean? Well, that means our new our new action Sam or new action is going to be one half times the integral of minus infinity plus infinity dE over two pi. Times one plus i epsilon 
e squared minus 1 minus i epsilon omega squared times q squiggly e q squiggly negative e plus f squiggly e q squiggly negative e plus f squiggly negative e and finally q squiggly e now again that's all we did was we are able to using this using this function using the Dirac delta we're able to go back in and substitute every every e in for an e prime which if we were to just take this Fourier transform and just do two e's here then we wouldn't have gotten this answer so this is necessary to do the Fourier transform to do each of these q q squareds as separate q's and then we can worry about what happens uh, it takes care of itself now this right here becomes a little relevant right we can take out uh we can kind of like take all of these i epsilons and stuff and we can just say that since it's infinitesimally small anything attached to that is just going to equal i epsilon itself so we can rewrite this as now e squared right here omega squared right here so it's e squared minus omega squared minus i ep i epsilon because it's a small positive infinitesimal it can just eat everything and it will still be a small positive infinitesimal hi sarah <laughs> What up, nerds? <clears throat> I am nerd. I am nerd. Okay. Um, where are we at? So we can simplify this. And now this right here, we are now going to write it as e squared minus omega squared uh, plus i epsilon. Now, oops, let's write that better. e squared minus omega squared plus i epsilon. We have seen this before. Where did we see this before? And hint, I said it at the beginning. I said something very specific about this. This itself we've seen in the past and then we had to add this to get something else. What was that? Na, 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 na. Okay, <clears throat> nerds rule the world. Hey, Manton. Hey, guess what? We get to do something fun now. So keep this in your mind. Where was this? Where we have, have we seen this before and why? Am I saying all of this is now equal to this? Uh, now we can do something really fun. What's that? A U substitution. Remember that integral trick that you did a million times in calculus? Now we're doing it again. So we've done like- You can we... call him Bone Daddy. <laughs> oh no. Propagators, Admiral Entropy is correct. That is the propagator. Very good, Admiral Entropy. Hang tight. Um. <laughs> Tyrion, what do I win? Uh, uh, you win something great. Okay. <laughs> um, what is the U substitution? Wow. Let's do this U substitution. Except instead of you, we're using X squiggly of E. And we're going to set it equal to Q squiggly E plus F squiggly E divided by E squared minus omega squared plus I epsilon. Uh, and then also notice, what does this mean? Well, this means the integral over, or the derivative over all Q is equal to the derivative over all X because this is a constant. Okay? Oh, Lord, you substitution. <laughs> Dear Gretel, math is his own language. I don't speak it either. That's why I have to watch each lecture twice to get the concept. That's all good. You must learn the concepts. It's true. It's very true. Concepts are fun and important for understanding phenomena. So there's our new substitution. What does this mean in terms of this integral? Well, I'm going to erase everything and we're going to write it down again. And this is where the magic begins. We have less than two pages to go. We're making great time. And <clears throat> all of this math, all of this, like, continuously, okay, now we're going to do a Fourier transform. Now we're going to do a U substitution. Now we're going to introduce functional derivatives. Now we're going to add source terms. Now we're going to take those complete. function derivatives. Did, did you guys really do the challenge? Dag, they changed that thing up. 
to like include it and then everybody did that almost the entire challenge today okay <laughs> i made what too small well <laughs> last time we tried to do like a hundred thousand and it's like it's like so is Eric just going through all of the super hard math concepts? <laughs> no, 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 it matters, okay? All of that stuff that I said, it matters, okay? Okay, here we go. Why does it matter? Well, let's rewrite the action. S, action saying one over, at, uh, one over two. Integral of minus one half to plus, or one half. Negative infinity, positive infinity of DE over two pi. Is now looks the following, right? We got X squiggle E. Um, times this thing, e squared minus omega squared plus i epsilon times x squiggle minus e minus f squiggle e, f squiggle negative e divided by e squared minus omega squared plus i epsilon. Woo! Roof. Roof, roof. Okay, now. We can combine the whole thing. We're going to combine the whole thing. And this is what it's going to look like. If we want to take the sum of all paths from 0 to 0. But in the meantime, we have from 0 to 0. And this is going to be the full thing. Ready? The exponent of, uh, I think it's i over 2, integral from negative infinity to positive infinity, of d e over 2 pi times f squiggle e f squiggle negative e over minus e squared plus omega squared plus i epsilon end bracket times so this is all our prefactor this is just exists with this thing right um plus i've lost my page oh here we are the integral over all q's, although they're now x's because we did the u substitution, that old shtick, i over 2, the integral of negative infinity to positive infinity of d e over 2 pi x. Now, if you've done any path integration, x squiggle e, you have seen this before, e squared minus omega squared, and this is probably what you were waiting for, um, x squiggle negative e. And then uh, round bracket? No, no round bracket, just square bracket. And we close it off. So this is the thing you've been waiting for before, right? This is the thing that you're used to. Uh, don't worry too much about it right now because we're about to do something that makes this go away and we're not gonna care anymore. Okay, so here comes the fun. Are you ready? This is the moment you've been waiting for. Hydrate, thank you, Lauren. Okay, the moment you've been waiting for. What's the fun? What happens if we set f equals to zero? If f goes to zero, then this all goes away and we only get this. We get the exponent to zero and then it's just one times this. This is without f. What does that mean? That means there's no external force. What does that mean? That means it's the ground state to the ground state with nothing acting on it. So therefore it can't do anything in between. It must stay at the zero state the entire time which means we can say that this actually normalizes this uh, with f equals zero to be one, okay? But, uh, so that means that everything else must happen. So if we have n none of that, like if we just have f, then that means that this is going to be one and that this is something we can handle. We can take care of this and, and see what happens with it. And uh, we can rewrite that and say that this is going to be the exponential of i over 2 times the integral of negative infinity to infinity of de over 2 pi. Am I in the, no, I'm not in the channel or the box yet. Uh, over f squiggle e, f squiggle negative e divided by negative e squared plus omega squared minus i epsilon, or plus i epsilon, doesn't matter. 
John Ken, welcome to the channel. Gian11, welcome to the channel. Uh, thank you for the follow, guys. Welcome in. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. We are finishing up our path integration lecture, and then we will move on to cyclical cosmology for funsies. Okay, now what does this mean? Well, now we have, uh, like I said, this has to be equal to 1 if f equals 0, so it's not going to be influenced by f at all. So if we want to talk about what f does, we can basically just talk about this top term right here. And by doing so, we can rewrite it, and that's what's the important part. Okay? Now, remember how we did the Fourier transform? Well, <laughs> We're going to undo the Fourier transform, or we're going to just do it again, however you want to think about it. It's probably best to think about doing it again, because again, we're going to have some, some squares in here, like the E squared terms, that we need to get rid of. What happens if now we're just looking at that first part, that all of the ones that depend on F, and we're going to do a Fourier transform back into T? Well, we'll just get the following. I'm not going to bother showing all the Fourier transform stuff again. It's already there, and it will be in the VOD, but we can do EXP to the i over 2, integral of negative infinity to positive infinity, dt, dt prime, f of, oh, I want to, let me write this down a little bit, or over more, one or the other, f, sorry, I just, I want to write it all on one level, uh, I think this will be the last chalkboard full, dt, dt prime, f of t, G? What are you doing here, G? Where'd you come from? The Green's function's back, right? What's the Green's function? Well, the Green's function in this case, I'll give it to you very specifically for this case, G of T minus T prime. Uh, I do have a VOD on the Green's function if anybody's interested in studying what the Green's function is. Uh, oh no, only... the Green's function. <laughs> there it is. It is, in fact, the Green's function. And what does the Green's function, why, what does it do have shown its, its face around here? Uh, and Admiral Entropy has maybe pieced it all together uh, since Admiral Entropy was the one who figured out what the rest of the, uh, what the Omega stuff was. But this is the definition of the Green's function. Uh, and you can go ahead and check the, um, the VOD if you would like to see more about it. More about it, doubt it. Okay. Uh, now, this is specifically the Green's function for the ha harmonic oscillator equation of motion, which follows this uh, one. And this is, I think this is exactly what we did, too. Is this not what we did? We did something very similar to that when we, de when we de uh, derived, or not derove, when we derived, when we derived uh, the Green's function, we did something of this form, for sure, because that's what it has to be. <clears throat> But it does solve this equation of motion, and uh, and that's all very necess necessary because now look at we're down to this. This is the only thing we have left to talk about, right? Uh, and what does this mean? Well, this right here is what we started with when we started talking about. Uh, I would love to do that and see actually. Ooh. Dr. Young and Neuro? Oh, we already did one. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, I would love to do that, or watch one, if someone else wants to do it, too. It's like Dr. Young and Neuro in my chat. I was like, okay, well, we already did one. You know what? We'll ask Melko. Damn it. Okay, anyways. <laughs> um, all right, what's next? The, uh, so we got here, and as you can see here, we'll get to the greens function, but ultimately... We're going to need this to give us the propagator. This is our ticket to the propagator, right? That's what we did before. And again, it has now showed itself up in, uh, in the path integration. We did all of that stuff. We did our, our reverse Fourier transform back to time. We got this term. We said, hey, we, we know that term. We've seen this term before. This term is the Green's function. Well, wait a second. If you have a Green's function, if you have this, you have the Green's function. If you have the Green's function, you get to the propagator. Hence, we have now redone the Feynman rules using path integration, um, which is awesome, right? We can get all the way back to the path integration. <clears throat> oh, the band. We getting the band back together? <laughs> 
Oh man. Okay, I'll let you deal with that while I finish this up. Anyways, now we can go ahead and say, hey, uh, we've done that. We can, we can talk about our propagators. Is there an easier way to write this down? There is. We need to talk about those time orderings. Remember all the time orderings with stuff we talked about? Well, that's relevant here, right? We can write down this super simplification. We can do all the time orderings from zero. That we remember our definition was one over I times the functional derivative of f of t dot 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 on this zero to zero state uh, evaluated when f is equal to zero because we're going to use all the f's to get as many perturbations as we want. Remember that perturbation theory is coming back. Now we can actually call it perturbation theory because we've seen it. So we're going to do as many perturbations as we want and then we'll set it the rest to zero once we realize that the pertur perturbative terms are not helping anymore and only making it worse. So now let's do a quick little, what does it look like? Uh, and where are they now? Uh, and we have QD1, the time order of QD1 and QD2 on the zero, zero state. And now again, remember last time we talked about Q to Q when we were talking about position to position, but now we're in Fox space. So we're gonna talk about the ground state to the ground state. And if we do this, then we can go ahead and act on, act on our, use our functional derivatives I lied, I think I'm gonna need another like equation or two on a fresh board, so you have to give me just a second. F T1, one over I, uh, functional derivative of F T2. Man, I keep writing T before F, it's driving me nuts. Functional derivative of F T2, and this will act on our amplitude of zero, zero F. But now, we know what this is, right? We've seen that, we've dealt with that, and we can bring it back because it's just going to be this guy, okay? So, let's get this back. Let's erase all of this. We're going to do this term, this stuff right here. We're going to just do two perturbation or two two of these functional derivatives to get down each of our our two pieces of uh, of the um, QT1 and QT2. So we're going to show you what that looks like, and we're going to bring this home. <clears throat> Uh, so we're going to act on the first functional derivative, and now we're going to get the following. 1 over i times the functional derivative of, I did it again, f q t 1. Uh, we're acting with 2 first, because we're going to say that 2 is greater than 1. That's sort of the whole idea of the, uh, of the uh, time ordering. d t prime, because we've acted on it with the t. And this is what it's going to get. It's going to get g, the Green's function of t2 minus t1, or sorry, t prime, excuse me, uh, and then ft prime. Notice how one of the fts is gone. That's because we did the whole functional derivative. That's how that works. Uh, and this is gonna be multiplied by that zero, zero f, okay? And then what's the last one gonna be? Well, one over i, functional derivative. No, no functional derivatives. What am I doing? We don't need the functional derivatives anymore. We've done it. We just get one over i times the Green's function. Now the whole integral is gonna go away. We're gonna get the Green's function of two t1, two minus t1, excuse me, and then plus a bunch of other terms with f. So we'll call them higher order in f. And this is when we say this is going to be, take the f equals to zero, and then uh, zero, zero, f, where f is equal to zero. What does this mean? Well, this just means we get one term, one over i times the Green's function for t2 minus t1. Now remember, this has a, a meaning. We had, it de uh, we had it defined right here, but this is it. This is how we get to the propagator. After all of that mess, after all of those things, the time warnings, the functional derivatives, the Fourier transforms, the u substitutions, we did all of that just to redo some of it, Fourier transforms and such, and we get back to this simple thing. After we did the whole time ordering, we figured out that it's just going to be the Green's function of two, t2, two, t2 minus t1. Can we see what it looks like on a simpler note? Sure. What if we did the sandwich of q... <clears throat> well, I'm just going to write q1 for qt1, q2, q3, and q4, where these are all... The subscript is the t, so but we'll have a simpler notation. 
Well, this is just going to be the following. 1 over i squared uh, times g t1 minus t2 g t3 minus t4 plus, am I above chat? Ooh, but not by much. g t1 minus t3 g t2 what minus again? t4, the imaginary number? plus uh, g t1 minus t4, g t2 minus t3. Whew. Is it above chat? It's above chat. We did it. So what is this? 1 over i squared is obviously just going to be 1 over minus 1 or just minus 1 um, in this particular case. But this is the general formula, right? We can go ahead, I'm not gonna write the general formula, it's in the notes. It is going to be all of the pairs of, of, of fields, right? We have, or well, <laughs> I say fields, <laughs> of Qs. Eventually it will be, next week it will be fields. Um, but yeah, it's just gonna be all the pairs of fields. And they all boil down nicely to just these simple Green's functions, again, defined on the previous chalkboard. So anytime that we have a time ordering, we can just write a sum of all of the pairs of the of the um, of the I'll just say fields because like I said next week we'll be on to fields uh, <clears throat> but yeah we're done we finished chapter six and we did through all of chapter seven this is it this is the beauty of it we went from something so messy to just a combination of greens functions which are very clearly defined.